Until the pandemic came and hit us, I think a lot of people were not quite so aware as to how much our lives are impacted by global events that might start anywhere. This is a real crisis. I mean, it's been clear that this was likely to spread in the U.S. We need to be thinking much more ambitiously. Climate finance is a very big issue. We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. CGD came about because it was time to focus not only on what developing countries should do, but much more on what the rich world should do. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? Some of our previous work has helped to come up with a kind of innovative financing mechanism that was used to help launch pneumococcal vaccines. We really have researchers and experts here at CGD who come at these issues from multiple vantage points and I think that's just what helps make our research more rigorous, more rich and actually more connected to the realities that decision makers are grappling with. We've been looking to CGD for all of your research and analysis uh, to guide us. So CGD is nonpartisan. Because of that, over the years, that credibility has given us significant convening power. Our government highly values the work. What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. Every single time that we're able to get it right, it means you know, we're reducing significant poverty. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Welcome everyone to the CGD event putting aid in its place, a new compact for financing health services. This, my name is Pete Baker. I am a policy fellow and the deputy director of the Global Health Programme here at CGD. This event, I think, comes at the perfect opportune time in global health policy. Countries around the world are, are facing a very difficult and challenging post-COVID economic crisis. Indeed, the World Bank and others estimate that over 30 countries will face a, uh, we'll, we'll end up having less uh, uh, government health expenditure in 2027 as they did prior to COVID. Many countries now are facing a debt crisis and are un it's unclear whether they will be able to afford the services under their current uh, UHC commitments. Development assistance and global health aid is stagnating and, it's, uh, and many global health agencies are finding that their replenishments and funds going forward may not be as rosy as they were in previous eras. Many are now asking if this global health architecture that was created partly around the MDGs uh, and the previous eras is quite fit for the future and is fit for, the UH, uh, for achieving the UHC goals uh, and the sustainable development goals that we all committed to um, for 2030. And particularly whether it's suitable uh, to achieve this in a way that really does truly empower national decision makers. So today we're here to present um, a new model for health financing based on research carried out at CGD, which offers to restore and, uh, and resolve many of those historic challenges in health financing, do it in a way that increases value for money and impact of health services, but critically do it in a way that reasserts the role of national governments as the key decision makers in their own health systems. So. Without further ado, we'll start with a short presentation by Tom Drake on the proposal. And then we're privileged to be joined by a panel of four eminent experts to discuss the idea. After Tom, I will turn one by one to those panel members and introduce them. Um, uh, but please, as usual, submit your questions via Twitter, email, or YouTube. We will provide links uh, on the screen shortly. So Tom, over to you for the proposal. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Pete. And I think someone is going to share some slides for me. Brilliant. Perfect. Great. Yeah. So thank you. And I'm delighted to be here with you today and looking forward to discussing some of the themes and ideas 
uh, in our recent paper. We'll put a link uh, in the chat um, if you haven't seen the paper yet. As Pete says, uh, we've gone for a sort of slightly provocative title of putting aid in its place, a new compact for financing health services. Um, I'll talk for just about 10 minutes or so and then go back to Pete for our panel discussion. Um, and yeah, we've we've had you know an unusual amount of interest, I'd say, in this paper since it was published a few weeks ago. So I'm really looking forward to to the discussion, getting to the panel discussion, and hearing what the panelists and uh, and you uh, have to say in your questions. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, okay, so just uh, to set the scene, as Pete has done as well, countries are facing multiple financial pressures. Uh, health financing in low-income countries was slowing even before COVID in Ukraine, uh, and now many are even uh, in more trouble with debt crises. Plus, uh, there is momentum for changing the global health sector, often referred to as decolonizing or localizing global health. And so there's appetite for change. There's, uh, and you know, others are looking at this. There's the, the Future of Global Health Initiative, uh, which John Arn, one of our panelists, co-chairs. Uh, and others, you know, many organizations are reflecting on how they can change their ways of working. So can we get more health for the money, stronger health systems uh, at the same time as shifting the balance of power? Uh, we think it, it could be possible. Next slide, please. Okay, so we start by identifying six key challenges with financing of health services in countries where aid is significant. So number one here is that at the program level, health aid is volatile and this purchase puts essential services at risk. So while total amounts of aid going to countries is relatively stable, this really sort of masks the volatility at the program level and programs run in these three to five year cycles. Um, and also leadership changes, you know, mean that there could be shifts in donor priorities uh, and that can cause problems for the um, delivery of, of uh, critical services, critical health services. Number two, fragmentation. So health aid is fragmented across various different organisations and channels. And this creates an enormous administrative burden for countries. This is a long-standing complaint, but it's no less serious because of it. Uh, and for just to give an example, a recent review in Tanzania found over 500 separate vertical projects. Number three is the displacement of domestic finance. It's sometimes referred to as the fungibility of health aid. So, and this can mean that donors are not really truly creating the change that they intend. It's of course hard to know for sure uh, how much uh, this happens, but that one study uh, estimated uh, displacement to be between 43 and 114 uh, percent. The challenge number four is that health services are often not effectively prioritized. This is a favorite issue for uh, us here at the International Decision Support Initiative. Uh, and the, the sort of the core principle is um, one of opportunity cost. If we spend money on one thing, it's not available to spend on something else. So it matters. It matters what we choose to spend our money on. It matters what priorities we set. And uh, both countries and donors, you know, really struggle with truly effective priority setting. Uh, number five, there is little planning for an appropriate and equitable aid exit strategy. So as countries thrive, aid will and should reduce, um, but too often there's no clear transition framework. Um, and as an example, Romania, in Romania, sort of a cessation of HIV funding led to uh, a serious spike in cases. And, and finally, of course, countries are not free to set their own priorities. So beyond the administrative challenges uh, I've outlined, there's a principle that decisions on public services should be made locally, uh, not in the US or the UK, Switzerland or, or any other country. Uh, and there's increasing support for a localization agenda. Um, and so what we're about to talk about could perhaps be a way, uh, a tangible way to localize power in global health. Uh, briefly, just a, a couple of, to remind ourselves of a, a couple of the uh, efforts that um, have been undertaken to improve health financing. Um, so we've got sector-wide approaches known as SWAPs. Uh, this is country level pooling of donor and government budgets for health, uh, first introduced in the 90s. Oh, yeah, sorry, next slide. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so your swaps, your country level pooling for donor um, 
uh, and government budgets. First introduced in the 90s, now much less common, uh, partly due to donors wanting clarity in what they're funding. We've got multilateral funds, uh, which is uh, supranational pooling of health financing. So we've got the World Bank, Gavi, Global Fund, and so on. Um, uh, these can be have been powerful uh, ways to focus attention and consolidate funding on specific issues, but have not led to a uh, significant reduction in fragmentation, quite possibly increased it. Um, aid effectiveness uh, and cost effectiveness. Uh, we can think of things like the Paris Declaration to differ its value for money focus to more recently the effective altruism movement, um, all very sort of worthwhile, but with the possible limitation that we can neglect uh, country institutions as the primary provider. So what could be done? Uh, we'll outline a, a, sort of a new compact for health financing based on three uh, principles, improved donor coordination at the country level. Uh, uh, sorry, strong... we need the next slide again, oh. please. <laughs> sorry, sorry. And I'm using notes that I can't see the screen. So yeah, please, next slide. I'll try to remember that. I think it's one more after that. No, no, sorry. <laughs> Back one on the, the one that, sh that is titled What Can Be Done. Uh, yeah. 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 So, uh, improved donor coordination at the country level is the first one. Uh, strong evidence informed prioritization is the second. Uh, and the third principle is uh, greater recognition that donors are auxiliary actors in partner countries. So, next slide, please. Perfect. So uh, just to set this slide up, um, a health benefits package is a list of services available to a population, typically at low or no cost. Um, and so, you know, we can think about designing a health benefits package and who funds what. Here, the bars are health services. Height is cost effectiveness, which is me, so the health that you get for the money. Or, or health or other things that you value. Um, and the width is your service cost. And so in panel A, you've got a reasonably typical um, or an illustration of a reasonably typical unprioritized inefficient health benefits package. Uh, and what IDSI and uh, many others work towards is improved prioritization of health benefits package where the things for evidence-based priority setting and the things that go in are things that give you the most health or um for the money uh, but here aid still disrupts country financing uh, so next slide please so c panel c here presents an alternative model where countries unify and manage core services while aid supports marginal services um, and this is the core of the proposal. So it's changing what aid is financing. The total budget envelope doesn't change. This isn't a call for new financing. Um, it's just about who funds what. Um, and it, it perhaps means that aid is not used to fund some of the things like bed nets and vaccines. Uh, they're likely highly cost-effective um, services. Uh, so the country manages this robust and reliable package that can then smoothly transition from aid uh, as uh, budgets as the economy strengthens and, and budget health budgets grow. Next slide, please. Brilliant. So now let's turn back to our six key challenges and we'll just reflect on the, the benefits that a marginal approach uh, might offer. So the first one was volatility. <clears throat> so uh, allowing domestic financing to focus on the core package protects the highest priority services from the fluctuations of aid investments. So next, you can see that health aid, so fragmentation is the next one. And so um, in a marginal approach, aid is consolidated into a cohesive and manageable offer um, at the margin and country health leaders and officials are freed up to manage their systems. Uh, the third one. Uh, so the third was uh, displacing domestic finances. So here, um, aid is is you know very clearly directed towards services that otherwise would not have been prioritised for investment by countries, and so therefore uh, we you know we know it to be additional to um, to what the country would have done anyway. Um, next one, please. 
So number four then was uh, prioritization. So priority setting systems would be strengthened through this approach. Priority setting is, is clearly a sort of a core part of um, the proposal. And this would yield more health money, both from uh, aid, but also from domestic financing as well. Uh, next. There's the aid exit strategy. So as we say, there's a clear and fair mechanism for reducing aid as country budgets grow, it will naturally crowd out uh, aid at the margin. And then finally, the next one is that countries are, of course, in the driving seat. They have greater powers to determine health priorities for the populations they represent. Next slide, please. So just uh, three more slides for me. So uh, going beyond the country perspective, so what we've talked about so far is so, uh, health services um, from the country perspective, but donors might also support specific goals of externalities uh, that would be undervalued um, just from a pure country perspective. So these could include things like cross-border surveillance, disease eradication, uh, antimicrobial stewardship, uh, and so on. Uh, and so this is perhaps an extra layer to our onion. Uh, so you've got your core services in the middle, of your, our sort of expanded top-up marginal services, and um, then perhaps an, an extra layer um, of uh, cross-border or services that have externalities where there's a rationale for donor financing as well. Next slide, please. Okay, some some challenges. So there's there's many. It's a it's, it would be a, it's a simple concept in some respects, but you know the devil is in the detail, and there would be plenty of complexity um, to try and transition to to an approach like this. So we'll we'll touch on a few of them, but perhaps we'll get more into this in the discussion. Uh, so the implementation. Uh, of the approach. So we've focused on country level changes. We think this is most likely to be the best way to realize the benefits we've identified. But, you know, it's also worth thinking about um, the interest in reform of some of the multilaterals. So, you know, what might a marginal approach look like for the Global Fund, for PEPFAR, for GAVI? Um, so that's something that uh, we're great to, to discuss further. Number two, prioritization. So, of course, there's limited priority setting capabilities in, in many partner countries. Uh, and as I've mentioned, strengthening priority, strengthening these capabilities would be a good in itself. And there's evidence that suggests that you can get something of the order of a nine to one return on investment from uh, improved priority setting in health. And to be there, our second one, that country, uh, of course, country and donor priorities may not always align. What do we do uh, with this? Uh, I think we would suggest that within limits, um, donors should uh, accept country priorities if they accept the policy process uh, was legitimate. Um, however, at the same time, you know, a marginal approach doesn't have to be total, and it could be that um, it would could would still be a big step forward to move most aid into a marginal approach, even if some targeted uh, funding. Um, that is separate from a marginal approach remains. And you can imagine things like provision of contraceptives or family planning and so on. Uh, so the third one here is donor incentives. Donors like to sell highly cost-effective spending to their stakeholders. Uh, these narratives can be really important. Um, but can we, you know, it would be sort of possible to uh, develop new statistical methods to allocate marginal impact to donors. Uh, and this might be a truer reflection of impact. Uh, and can we also develop better narratives around long-term change? Um, and then, so 3B, uh, global health architecture is built around uh, high-income country perspectives of priorities. Um, so how confident would we need to be to pursue major reforms to an architecture that clearly does, does much good? Um, next slide, please. Just a concluding slide to recap. So our three pillars of a marginal aid approach are improved donor coordination at the country level, strong evidence for informed prioritization, and greater recognition that donors are auxiliary actors in partner countries. And so this means that donor financing should be directed towards a cohesive package of interventions uh, to top up a core country-led health benefits package. Uh, potential benefit of this could include the health financing prior priority services and a stable, cohesive value for money. Priorities are set locally by public health officials 
um, who are able to focus on building, you know, a really sustainable health system, uh, and that there is a clear and equitable pathway for reducing AIDS. Uh, and with that, I will stop and return to Pete. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tom, for a nice, uh, succinct summary of, of the idea. Of course, there's more in the blog and the policy paper online and uh, a supporting uh, more academic piece on F1000 that people should uh, refer to. But So now we'll turn to the panel one by one. Um, first, can I invite John Arne uh, Rottinger, who's Ambassador for Global Health at the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, John Arne, if, if you don't mind, what we're doing now is to, to just provide some initial reactions, uh, perhaps looking at your view on the strengths and the challenges and any extensions or other ideas you might have on, on how we should take this forward. So over to you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Pete. And, and uh, congratulations to Tom and the team. Um, uh, it's a, a very interesting concept, definitely. The marginal health approach, uh, it's interesting conceptually and, and theoretically. And, and I think a lot is related to practicalities and, of course, uh, political economy. And you focus on some of that. So why is it, uh, why is it sort of strong? Uh, I think the, the way you focus on achieving health impact through setting clear priorities and prioritizing at the market. John, I Hybrid think we so we might have just lost you a second. Are you okay? I think you're back. Um, you said that you said uh, strong focusing on the margin. I think is the last thing I had. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, um, and and also the fact that you set countries in the primary decision making position uh, on needs and priorities, uh, and maybe even more importantly than that, than those sort of specific goals is also the the point that this will require a coordinated financing process uh, in countries, both domestic and external financing and aligning uh, with budget cycles. And just achieving that in its own right would actually also be beneficial. Uh, it will also require transparency uh, and, and more sharing of information and data across actors, government and, and external aid agencies. Uh, and I think that would also be very uh, important and important in its own right. Uh, but there are also many questions. Uh, should all aid be on budget? Uh, is this really a sector-wide approach in disguise? Uh, and in a way, it is a sector-wide approach, but with a very specific model on how to do it, uh, which is interesting, as I said. Um, but we also have questions on who should be implementing uh, the financing uh, and who makes those decisions. Um, should donors be able to prioritize their marginal investments or should this also be based on ranked order of priorities by the country government as you in a way ideally indicate? Um, and how then to align earmark targeted or results based health aid? And as we know, the majority of external finance is actually targeted today. Um, so how do we align the missions of those targeted investments? Uh, and a final question, how, how to ensure reaching marginalized groups, key population groups, or, or hard to reach communities. They may not be covered in government plans. And, and how do we really negotiate in many ways the, that uh, balance? Um, but overall, I, I think this is definitely an interesting approach. Um, uh, you mentioned in the beginning, Tom, the, the initiative that Kenya and Norway are currently shepherding uh, on discussing how global health financing can be improved uh, together, with, together with other governments from both the Global South and the Global North, as well as foundations, multilaterals and civil society. And um, and I think we can definitely be inspired by, by your thoughts uh, and we're looking forward to, to the discussion. Excellent. Thanks, John. Um, really uh, interesting thoughts. I was particularly struck by the, the idea of transparency and data sharing in and of itself being quite an interesting and important outcome. I'm not sure that's what we picked that up in our paper. Um, and of course, the concerns around marginal groups and how to align earmarked uh, and targeted funds with this. And we have, uh, we can definitely provide some reflections on that later. But let, let's go around the, the panel and, and hear fir first reactions from everyone, if you don't mind, before we do that. So thanks, John. Uh, so next, um, over to Agnes Sukat, who is the head um, or Division of Health and Social Protection at, at France's Development Agency, so AFD. So Agnes, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. And, uh, and thanks, Tom, for a great presentation. And uh, generally, uh, a big thank you to CGD for uh, continuing to plow 
uh, the, the field of this debate on the effectiveness of, of development aid. Um, I think this paper is, is more than timely and, and welcome, as uh, I was mentioned uh, by, uh, by John Arner. Um, following the, um, the pandemic, I mean, the, 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 the immense uh, shock that this pandemic uh, has uh, had on the country's uh, uh, well-being and 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 uh, both uh, from from a health perspective with uh, billions of deaths as well as from the economic perspective. I think it's about time to rethink how we invest in health globally, um, both in uh, in developing countries and in in our countries because we can only call our efforts um, to, to prevent uh, the consequences of this pandemic, uh, we can only call it a failure. It's a collective failure. So it's really time to rethink, and in many ways, we're not doing enough of this. Uh, we talk about uh, rethinking um, our investments in health post-pandemic, but we see very little, maybe with the exception of the newly created pandemic fund that is actually addressing a critical issue that was under uh, invested, which was the question of the global public goods and uh, the, the subsidization of the production of these global public goods at country level. The fact that global public goods are not only uh, created in one place uh, in some kind of supra global uh, location, but that global public goods are created everywhere, every day, and that we need to invest in every single country for the creation of these global public goods. So that your proposal in many ways comes as a complement to that. And if I look at um, what you have identified as the key challenges, they, they are immense, and um, we've seen the development aid for health increase over the past 20 years. They have, in, they have uh, increased uh, uh, about as fast as, um, as economic growth. Um, but we can't see the uh, financial added value because there has been uh, a crowding out of domestic financing. Uh, that is uh, uh, related to this aid in low-income countries because there is this displacement, there is a lack of absorption of development aid. And um, at the end, it cannot say, it cannot be said in 2023 that development aid for health brings money. It brings priorities because it's the money is actually displaced largely from uh, from domestic budget so what development aid does is provide priorities so whether these priorities are the right one or not is is beyond the, the this debate um in many ways they are uh, when we think uh, about uh, uh, infectious disease such as uh, hiv and, and tb or investing in vaccination but there are also other ones like investing in pandemic preparedness and that has not been done. Uh, so the, the choice of what is subsidized and what is prioritized by development aid is not that clearly, uh, um, let's say, done in an in a, in a inclusive and transparent way. It just happens through a, a political process that is not always clear uh, where it is actually uh, guided from and, and, and how, how it functions. So we end up with these funds that, are, um, that were indeed adapted to the MDGs but are no longer fit for purpose when we need to address the health consequences of climate change, biodiversity loss or uh, pollutions or even AMR. And here we, we find ourselves um, with these big tools that are, are, are not working anymore, really, for, um, to address the challenges of, uh, of our time. But maybe what is more problematic even, um, and, and you mentioned it in the sixth point about the country's own priority, is when development aid funds the most 
cost effective, the most impactful uh, interventions that um, and those who have um, who are common goods, who have elements of uh, market failures in them, then it undermines the social contract because then it is aid that funds basic public services, which are the currency uh, uh, of 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 the political um, the, the the political discourse. So the, the, there, you've really uh, um, a fundamental uh, effect of undermining the, the the formation of universal health coverage and pooling of resources at domestic level to fund a package of public services that um, all citizens agreed should be funded collectively. In this case, there is another entity elsewhere um, in, in, uh, in global health organizations that make decisions for the people. And of course, um, it doesn't contribute to, to the building of, of these institutions of societal dialogue and, and budget prioritization um, that are at the heart of the public financing of, um, of, of uh, basic services which contribute to the social contract, contribute to social cohesion. And we know that in return, those contribute to, to economic growth and, and, and poverty reduction. So I think really um, I'm, I'm more than welcoming the proposal. Of course, there are a lot of issues about how to do it. And uh, I don't think we should underestimate uh, the difficulties. It's um, They are very similar to the the difficulties that we've uh, uh, encountered while trying to link performance uh, to uh, to development aid with results-based financing. There's a lot, a lot of uh, asymmetry of information. There is a lot of uh, questions to be had about uh, what should be the marginal investments. But I think the, the, the fundamental value proposition that the basic services that have both uh, externalities and are at the heart of the social contract because they are impactful on, on, on the poorest and represent the core uh, package of essential services that a country provides, uh, um, provides to its citizen with the public subsidy. That is uh, really the fundamental value proposition here that we should support. And it should no longer be donors who substitute uh, for, for governments and collective action in building that social contract. So congratulations for the paper and uh, looking forward to how to operationalize the, the concept and use it as a as a guidance to, to, to reform the global health architecture. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, thanks, Agnes. And uh, yeah, I particularly liked how this can look like a, a technical recommendation on the surface, but actually, as you say, it's, it's really about restoring the social contract around the core package of services, uh, which is a, 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 as, is, has big political economy um, pros and cons, I guess. So like it has lots of advantages, of course, but many interest groups on in-country and in donors will be uh, concerned <laughs> about some of these suggestions and we need to talk that through. And I would love to hear a bit more about the results-based financing insights and so on. Um, I think we need to learn from historical efforts in this work uh, and perhaps we can come back to that later. But um, now I'd love to turn to um, Katachu, um, who's a health advisor from FCDO um, currently in Ethiopia, but previously an advisor and chief of staff to the state minister's office at the Federal Ministry of Health of Ethiopia. But I'm aware we've had some technical problems. So can we try and turn to Katachu and see whether he can provide some initial reactions to this idea? And could I? Possibly get some feedback from the from our uh, events and IT colleagues um, about the, the success or so lack of. Pete, I can see a message from them that he's dropped off again, but they'll let us know if he rejoins. Okay, great. Um, so, well, not great, of course, but um, it'll be he, he's uh, 
got a lot of insights on this issue. Um, but do we have Regis then? So Regis Hitamana is a Chief Benefits Officer at the Rwanda Social Security Board, which manages um, uh, a range of things, but also in particular here manages the community-based health insurance scheme for Rwanda, which is one of the largest schemes in the country. Um, Regis, over to you for some initial reactions. Oh gosh. Okay, this is not going well so far on the um, uh, on the uh, Getachew and Regis side. They seem to have both be struggling with internet connections, which is very unfortunate because Regis's particular role is to try and work out what benefits should be provided for the country um, and uh, and to do that in partnership with donors. Um, so we will try our best to reconnect, but for now we'll have to um, do the next round of issues. I, I think perhaps the most interesting next question is to try and dig in, in into the, the non-technical side of this, into the political economy side of this. Um, so to think about who will gain out of this and who would lose, um, and think about how donors might react to it, how countries might react to it, um, which ones may be more suited to this or may prefer it, um, and perhaps also how we could think about different models that would that would meet those different incentives and different needs. So, uh, John, can I can I return to you first with that mindset? Like, what is the, what do you see as the political economy of this, and how do we adapt it to make it work for people's needs? Mm. So maybe first think about who will be able to, to sort of adapt it first. I think, and that's that's the bilateral donors. Uh, given that bilateral donors, at least um, from a starting point, uh, have uh, more. Um, sort of freedom to operate, uh, I think, uh, and, and probably, of course, they can, they have political priorities, but but they would normally, of course, um, do establish priorities through a dialogue with, with their implementing partner country. Um, and, and of course, um, there, we have some big bilateral donors uh, in, uh, in health, um, the US being the biggest, the, the challenge is that the, the biggest grants from the US, they are, as we know, through PEPFAR and, and some of the other very targeted programs. So then they will fall into the same category as the multilaterals that I will come back to. Um, but you have uh, Japan, Germany, uh, UK as, as least traditionally big donors. And, and I think they could be able to, to use such a framework and, and definitely also to coordinate them among bilateral donors. The more challenging side is really the the dedicated funding we, we have established through the Global Fund, uh, through Gavi, through PEPFAR uh, for specific um, uh, diseases or specific technologies. Um, the challenge there, I was thinking a bit around that because um, uh, we know that these funding mechanisms have mobilized funding also because of their specificity, as you also highlight in their paper, uh, in your paper. Um, and and there is a political economy related to the resource mobilization part that needs to be maintained in some way at least or or you need to um, establish a new a new agenda a new advocacy sort of uh, campaign around it um, so that's on the resource mobilization side if we take for granted that there needs to be some still continued targeting uh, making sure that um, that at least substantial parts of, of uh, that funding would need to make sure that they deliver on on the three big infectious diseases or or, or vaccination programs. I think uh, you could still integrate that into a marginal health aid approach. Uh, the challenge would be almost the same challenge we have today regarding potential displacement, because if you know very clearly that external donors coming in at the margin that they will need to at least see some some of their needs met or some of their impacts met um, that will already then uh, affect the priorities of government, uh, including both the, the 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 scale of investments and and of course the scope or the or the specificity of investments. Even though trying to do it within a a rigorous uh, evidence based priority setting framework, uh, so we will then go back in sort of square the circle and come back to the same problems of displacement. So how do we reconcile um, that challenge? Because I think that will be definitely for many years uh, 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 on a recurrent challenge. Um, and, and probably the one way approach or one approach to this is to, to really make sure that we have 
accountability on, on the processes regarding priority setting uh, and that you have independent actors uh, being part of the, the process. And, and actually, the more actors you have, in a way, the more the, 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 the harder it would be to, to avoid trying to be rigorous in your attempt to, to really rank in a way, because that's the, the beauty of the or also the challenge of the approach is to really rank health investments based on, on impact and cost effectiveness. Um, um, and that speaks to what I mentioned briefly, the need for full transparency, both on process, but also on, on data and performance. And, and, uh, and I think that is actually a, a challenge in our current system is um, insufficient sharing of information and data across all actors involved, both on the financing as well as the implementation side uh, of health in, in individual countries. Excellent. Th thank you, John. Yes, um, I guess displacement and fungibility can happen in lots of ways. And um, if a country is really wants to do that, there's, not, there's only so much health financing design that donors can to do to prevent it. So it's, going, it's going to happen anyway. Um, but perhaps this approach offers some benefits in terms of transparency and accountability that could be created around that priority setting process. Mm -hmm. So you, you could have clearer line of sight from donors to what's actually in the end delivered, potentially. Um, although I'm sure uh, that depends very much on the details of, of what's proposed uh, in each country's model. I think the Global Fund is an interesting one here where it could actually be quite attractive to them as a, as a co-financing, as a progression of co-financing to, to shift some resources onto countries or, or costs onto countries, particularly the most cost-effective options. So I could imagine the Global Fund seeing this as, as quite an attractive option, but I could also imagine them seeing it as quite a threat um, to their very model. So I, I look forward to hearing some feedback from, from my Global Fund colleagues. But, um, Agnes, uh, over to you to, to discuss the political economy elements of this and your view on, on who might be a champion and who might not, and, and how we might produce different models that would meet their needs. Well, certainly we would be happy to be uh, to be champions. Um, Great. Certainly in, um, in, in France, there are many, uh, I think, stakeholders who would uh, like to start this conversation um, and, and see how we can develop uh, better models of, uh, of funding. Um, I think one one aspect to it is really the uh, very heavy um, tilting of development aid for health on products. That's really that first conversation to have. Why is it so attractive for uh, donors and even for the civil society to advocate for purchasing products and distributing them? This is a very interesting question that would warrant a sociological and anthropological study, I think. <laughs> Why is it not attractive to fund the training of health workers while there is a global shortage right now, while for decades um, there has been very little investment in training schools, in medical schools, in nursing schools, in, in, in low and middle income countries? Um, and why and we've seen it during COVID, the one attraction was to buy something that is sold by the pharmaceutical sector. So there are obviously a lot of interest there. Um, the fact that uh, aid is uh, always so interested about uh, mobilizing funding to buy uh, pharmaceuticals and medical products in general and is much less interested in investing in human capital or physical capital. We, we know we have very little data about capital investments because the national health accounts capture mostly um, recurrent cost. But the need for investment is immense. I mean, the, the latest uh, analysis, uh, some coming from the um, the SDI surveys of the World Bank and, and, and some from other sources show that 60% of health centers in Africa don't have uh, electricity and 40% don't have water. And an even uh, larger uh, uh, number doesn't have connectivity. 
Um, so why is it not attractive to fund um, to fund health facilities, uh, um, in, uh, infrastructure? Is a big question because then you go back to the fundamentals of development financing, uh, which is to 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 uh, to um, to ensure that investments are financed and that governments fund recurrent costs. I think there is a lot there to 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 really sort of go back to to the basics of principles. I mean, first uh, thinking about um, the importance of identifying market failures and see that governments need to really fund public goods and uh, common goods that have strong market failure uh, characteristics. Um, and then uh, really working at uh, at this question of uh, understanding the full cost of services, that just uh, inundating countries with products is not going to make them uh, deliver services necessarily. And we've seen it uh, even during COVID-19 with, with COVAX, where at the end uh, there were uh, large quantities of vaccines being delivered uh, that were not used. Right. So we, we still haven't completely measured uh, the amounts that uh, of financing that went into vaccines that have not been used. But it's the same story again and again. It was the same with uh, uh, ACT for malaria several years ago, where large quantities were bought and they expired on shelves or uh, in stocks. I think we, we really need to first and foremost uh, put that conversation on the table that development uh, aid for health is not just about uh, purchasing products and just loading them um, on uh, loading them on ministries of health to have to figure out what they're going to do with it. But that we, we, we think about the entire financing of services so that's for the, the sort of global question that uh, global health financing is not equal to buying products. And uh, I think that conversation should be had with all the, um, the major vertical funds, Gavi, Global Fund, uh, because this most of what they're financing is products. And if, if this is to, to continue, then there should not be expectations that this um, this actually funds uh, health systems investments or um, or, or uh, results overall. It just funds products. So and and the fact of funding products only is automatically creates a displacement uh, because you you just have a production function in which you have some inputs who are funded at a level at which the other inputs are not. So you're just limited by um, the, um, the limits there are on, on your other essential inputs like, like labor, like human resources. So that's, that I think is, is the main conversation that needs to happen in the global political economy. Again, I think COVID has been really a wake up call in this respect with, with the creation of the pandemic fund so asking the question of subsidiarity and, and what is the role of, uh, of a part of global money and, uh, and I think how this leverages investments in health systems at country level and, and your proposal should be part of a broader conversation that um, uh, aid money should be always um, provided on a, on the basis of a of a compact and a leveraging uh, a leveraging agreement. Thanks, Agnes. It's really interesting to think of this from a commodities versus other inputs lens. Appreciate that, um, Tom. I want to come back to you to hear, hear your reflections on, on what's been said so far. But before we do that, I just that we've had some comments in from Twitter and on YouTube and on LinkedIn. Um, uh, so I want to feed those to you as well so you can respond to them. Um, so one of them um, is a series of three, actually, that are all very related. So from Emmanuel um, and from a legal office from an organization, I can't, it doesn't say, 
Um, essentially, they're getting at the idea of prioritization. So they want to know uh, how would prioritization work in this proposal, um, how a stakeholder has been engaged, and so on. So I think it'd be good to to respond about um, how this could flexibly interact with the prioritization agenda. Um, and then the second stream of questions on Twitter was about uh, what are some actual concrete steps, like over the next two years or something, um, what might, how might this actually advance as an idea and uh, how might this actually be implemented in countries? Thanks, Pete. I mean, I might be able to duck answering that immediately because I can see there's messages that Geta2 and Regis are online. And if they are, I think it'd be really great to hear from them. So do you want uh, well, to try going to them? Yes. And if not, I will come in. Uh, so, Kitachi, um, are you are you there and can you hear us? If not, <laughs> can you turn to Regis? No. Oh, sorry. My apology. My network is not. So let's give this Seven. one try, Kitachi. We'd love to hear your. Yes, just about. We'd love to hear your initial uh, thoughts on this me. idea. And. Okay, we'll try one last time. Uh, for, it'd, be, it'd be great to hear uh, what how this looks from, uh, from your perspective. I think it's very excellent. I think it is okay. very, very great in the. And, and an excellent idea it's very effective that's not complete you know some of the donors are not uh, interested to join join SDG pool fund otherwise the SDG pool fund you know creates ownership for for fans and you know align the activities which is uh, used for the pension that the minister of health is uh, designed uh, your, your proposal is very, very nice. Uh, and I like, you know, uh, the marginal approach, specifically uh, the donor group has to be support on the priority setting. Uh, and, you know, uh, using uh, uh, the, the, the marginal approach is very, very excellent. Uh, my question is on the practicality issue. As, as you, you already mentioned on the challenge, the practicality issue might be, you know, uh, a little a little bit difficult for some donors from the, the donors' policy as well as uh, the relationship between the bilateral uh, the country that they are working. Some donors might be now not happy with the political situation or. to give a value for money and a more if proposal. Okay, we're, we're, we've lost you again, I'm afraid, Tachu. Um, Hunter and, and colleagues, can we turn to Regis? Advocate on that one, if the donor fund... And, and can we mute Katachu as we're trying to sort out his... Uh, is not stable. Uh, his reception. Uh, no, the... uh, Regis, now I think I think we're you you're back. Me? Wonderful. So uh, Regis, the chief um, benefits officer at RSSB, uh, I'd love to hear from a Rwandan perspective um, your view on this proposal, and, and, and maybe to answer the final Twitter question: How would you see this actually progressing in Rwanda? How could it actually happen? <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me very well. We hear you well. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, and and sorry for for joining late. Um, I think this proposal is uh, very interesting, uh, and I wish it to. Uh, and the paper is uh, is very eloquent. I think to convince partners to this new approach uh, for Rwanda that uh, uh, that has enjoyed um, um, uh, a lot of donor support, unfortunately, um, from few partners in in in. in uh, that are sharing a big share, so sharing a big part of the donor that come, the funding that comes to Rwanda. But in in the same way, in the same uh, um, um, in parallel, government have never, which I think uh, happens in some contexts, have never reduced allocation to health sector. 
uh, year on year. Probably we can look at per capita, but year on year allocation to health sector has been increasing, and uh, um, uh, community health, ins health insurance has been able to mobilize the population. We are now uh, close to 90% of coverage, and um, I think now we are shifting the the thinking to to uh, and and a lot of programs as we foresee are pushing everything to the insurance and the insurance will not be able to cover all, all of the, the package and that's why recently we have come up with the uh, benefit package uh, design for the, the health insurance and we are faced with uh, those difficult discussions of what do we cover and what do we don't cover this paper is uh, very interesting in a way that uh, actually um, some of the programs that are still donor funded are uh, we know uh, that are very uh, critical. Uh, we should be covering them as insurance in the first place. And uh, uh, when we don't have them in our package, we end up committing to more. I, I, I don't know if uh, uh, that makes uh, sense to. So we commit to more tertiary care because there is a part of the, 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 the expenses that we should be covering that are funded by donors. So that for us, it's very uh, challenging on the phase out, uh, which might be painful. Uh, and hopefully, there will be a good uh, plan for it. But otherwise, um, today, when we are doing benefit package, we say, okay, this is cost effective, but do we have someone else to cover? If yes, then we prioritize other, other, other services. Um, so, uh, the other thing I like uh, with this approach is that if government commits to, to, to covering most essential services, most important services. Actually, um, uh, even if when there is a donor phase out because of predict predictability issues, you know that uh, it all depends on, uh, on, on uh, political uh, relationship between countries. Um, I think um, if it happens, it will not be disas as disastrous as it can be when it happens uh, in the current funding model. Because at least primary health care will be prioritized and probably few services at special level that uh, are, are are targeting maybe uh, five to ten percent of the cases. Uh, of course, equally important, but I think uh, there will be no 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 big uh, political issues when 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 donor phase out happens. That's what I like. One thing uh, that I kept reflecting about it is uh, the importance of donor funding on uh, scaling up new services. Uh, that is a good investment, uh, which I think uh, partners should still consider uh, when there are new services. Uh, it took a lot of more than a decade to scale up uh, HIV, TB, malaria services into primary health care facilities. And it is now taking much more time with non-communicable disease because there is no funding for it. I think coming in as an investment uh, for five, ten years and uh, leaving slowly to the services to, to the insurance schemes, uh, I think that would um, make huge changes uh, because today when we are looking at uh, benefit package, we, the last question we ask ourselves is, is this service available? In the perspective of insurance, we say it's not available, then let's prioritize others. And government, with the goodwill that they have to have them, unfortunately, funding is not sufficient to scale up. We know services are needed to the population, but they are not available yet. I think that's uh, one small nuance that I had on this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Just now, that's a, that's very important. That so the idea that it might be useful for donors to support a new uh, service, sort of starting off and some some fixed costs early on, and and bringing new ideas, um, um, doesn't immediately fit with this way of, of working. And we need to we need to think about that more. Um, so I appreciate that that comment. I'm I'm afraid we've run out of time, sadly, for this uh, for this session. There's there's so much more we could talk about. So perhaps perhaps we can come back for uh, another session to dig into some of these additional issues. Um, but can I give the last word uh, to Tom to respond to some of the, the ideas that have been raised today? Um, uh, and then we can close out. So, so thank you to the panel and over to Tom. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Really, really good to hear your thoughts and really pleased that there's interest in the, in the paper. I just I respond to the, the question. There was a, a sort of a question about concrete next steps. So maybe just very briefly, uh, you know, I guess the, the next steps would be four, four steps. So better understanding the uh, the challenges that we've kind of sketched out and the benefits of, the, of this proposal. We've talked about building 
better operational model. So what is a, what does an operational model or a transition model look like for, at a country level? What might it look like for, for a fund? Um, so operating models is number two. Number three, I guess, building a coalition, or maybe there's a better way of framing that, but we've talked about the need to, um, to sort of get champions and have people to sort of get enthusiastic and get excited about this. Um, and then four, perhaps, it would be to, to pilot it somewhere to actually, uh, you know, once we've, you know, done a lot of the work to, to build the proposal uh, properly um, to actually try it uh, in practice somewhere. So if you're interested in working with us on this, uh, please do reach out and get in touch. Back to you, Pete. Okay, wonderful. So thanks to all the panel. Um, and thanks to all those who, who joined and log in. Um, stay in touch with CGD and uh, do, do share your thoughts on the proposal. So thank you and have a good day. Thank you.